Hello everyone and welcome to the stream. So happy to have you all. Hello Vondanolo. Thank you for the 36 month resub and streak. Three years running. We all love to see it. Also, hello Vesper Fortune. Hello Cute Gamer Grill. Hello Master Fail. Hello Lothkaraman. Hello Lucky the Koi Fox. And of course of course, a big hello to Alistair Nia. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, any Californian here? <laughs> um, they call me 36 month your subscriber Dolo, probably. <laughs> but yes, welcome, everybody. I know I haven't streamed in a bit. Um, you know, life is a is a heck. And then I had my I had my gum graft, which I do my follow up uh, appointment tomorrow. But so I think, well, we'll find out then if it worked or not. Basically, which is a very unfortunate system. <laughs> um, but um, I hope you guys are doing good tonight. Uh, the the overall you know plan of the evening is pretty simple. I don't. I think this is going to be a super long stream, uh, but yo, Alistair, yeah, thank you for the 25 month resub. You'll love to see it. Kitty maxing to the max. Um, and uh, what was I about to say? Oh, yeah. So the, the goal of tonight is we're going to be talking about my uh, my D&D &D setting um eberron ashes of the last war i mean not <laughs> jk jk of force of habit we're gonna be talking about nexus uh my homebrew setting um so that is the plan um god what was i thinking about uh but yeah so we um we're gonna be talking about my very own homebrew setting which is also going to be the setting uh that's going to be featured in my next uh, my next uh, D and D uh, series um, after you know now that Ashes is just about done um, after I come back from my my hiatus break um, so we're also going to talk about that campaign a bit and my wonderful players who who the NPC companions are going to be all that fun stuff so if you ever have any questions um, about my setting or anything just let me know just pop them in the chat I'm happy to answer anything that comes along. I did uh, a couple streams uh, a while ago where I talked, I did like preliminary world building for Nexus. And in the interim, I have since done a lot more world building. <laughs> um, and I've changed a lot of stuff from the original, the original uh, interpretation that I did. So this uh, wonderful um, Clip Studio paint will serve as my, my canvas for writing down random things. Um, so uh, what is Nexus? Nexus is my homebrew setting. Um, hello, hello, Nick. Happy to have you. Um, it is a D&D &D setting that takes place in a world which is literally Obsidia, everything that Obsidia thinks is cool, uh, put into one place. <laughs> it's actually the combination of another, um, another setting I worked on long ago. Uh, which I never end up doing anything with for a different RPG. Um, and so, oh, I need to turn on the music. I've got the the last seahorse for those those sweet Euro beats in the background. So let me know if it's too loud or too quiet, please. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so Nexus, um, it is a setting that has all my cool stuff in it. And so the overall um, the overall vibe of it is kind of a diesel punk meets arcano punk kind of effect. Like the base, like there are several nations throughout the world um, at a very good, a uh, very good, very different, uh, like overall technological levels. Um, but a lot of them supplement if they're like there's one very advanced nation and there's more of like a trickle down slash less refined versions of a lot of their technology in um 
in in other nations uh and so um sh shut up b b is the reason why everything bad exists <laughs> JKV. B is going to be one of my players in my in my campaign. Um, and she is a good bead. However, she uh, autistically seeks to undermine everything I, I, I set up. Uh, <laughs> and so um, there actually is not that much Iron Kingdoms, uh, to be honest, Lothgarman, in my setting. Um, only, only a couple Iron Kingdoms-esque uh, things in it. I largely went for much more of my own stuff. So, um, but yeah, so the basic setting is, uh, like, there is, uh, this world is a, f a colony planet, essentially. Um, it works in a, uh, in a, in a universe, uh, that exists in, like, the D&D &D multiverse, kind of. Um, that uh long ago the planet was discovered by planeswalkers uh who ended up uh basically settling on it because it was a nexus point uh between a lot of different planes of reality and magic and everything um and so uh what was it and so they they started settling people and species came from other planes to to live there and then uh disaster struck nobody knows what happened exactly but 2000 years ago a event called the uh the infinite eclipse occurred which basically cut off the planet from the greater the greater D, &D uh planar multiverse um, and with that, the overall, uh, magic level of the planet, uh, decreased as, you know, basically your connections with the planes weakened. So things that required, um, that required the planes to function no longer did. Um, and so in the wake of that, the, the ancient planeswalker civilization, who was called, uh, they're just called the Wayfarers, uh, by all of the successor um civilizations that now exist on the planet uh basically eventually collapsed and nobody's quite sure why it collapsed or how it collapsed but it did um and so there existed about 1500 years of not great times um uh, where uh where basically there were no gods in the world anymore because they'd all been cut off uh, to, from accessing it. A lot of the, um, you know, old magic tech stuff no longer functioned because they didn't have the energy sources for it. And so a lot of civilizations devolved into much more of like a feudal fantasy um, style society. And I'm going to take a brief break to, to say that Kano is my pog champ. So... Kano, I want you to know that I'm just saying what we've all been thinking, and that's that you, Kano, yes, you, you are my little pog jam, <laughs> and there's nothing that'll change that. Um, and so in this interim period, uh, there was basically a lot of exploitation by the Fae, because the, the Fae exist um, to a strong degree um, in the inner workings of the world, and with no gods anymore, the Fae basically were, like, stepping in as patrons and kind of acting like gods to the people, even though they don't actually get supported by by mortal souls or the, you know, the energy of belief at all. They just thought it was really fun to, to make mortals give stuff up and fuck with them. <laughs> um, hey, Cyrus. Welcome, welcome. Oh. Uh, and so... That continued for a while, and then about 500 years ago, uh, the uh, so the so-called um, gods of the setting were quote unquote rediscovered. <laughs> um, so by being rediscovered, it was the the theology of the world reworked itself that the these gods had always existed and for whatever reason were were cut off. Um, were cut off from 
uh, being able to support mortals. And so once they were discovered and they started actively helping and empowering mortals, it started a um, basically a deific, uh, you know, self-perpetuating cycle. Um, <laughs> all right, Master Phil, you get the excited obsidian noises in the background. Um, and so, uh, they then rose to basically being the, the, the resident gods of the setting. There's a lot of different religious systems in my, in, in Nexus. Um, a lot of it having to do with, like, ancestor worship in different ways. Um, but one of the most prevalent faiths throughout the world is, it's called the Tetrarchy. Um, and because it consists of, uh, four different gods. There is, um, there is Termina, who is the goddess of life and death and the eternal cycle. Um, there is Cognisius, who is the god of ingenuity, um, and invention. There is Gladius, who is the god of survival and combat. And then there is Amora, the goddess of community and, and basically civilization. And so they formed the core of basically giving structure to a lot of these societies and helping them start to advance uh, technologically and socially beyond their point. So that existed for about 500 years um, in the past. And so then 200 years ago, allegedly a fifth god was discovered or was rediscovered. However, she's kind of crazy in the eyes of many of the people of the world. So they, um, so she's not like officially, uh, she's not officially sanctioned by the Tetrarchic faith. Hey, Sir DB, welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, she's not officially sanctioned. However, there is a sizable population that worships her, which is, um, she is the goddess Vanyaska, who, she is the goddess of industry, like raw production industry. And because of a complicated uh, thing where basically she was discovered or was rediscovered in the land um, of basically a juridic nature uh, civilization, it ended up leading to a civil war as a lot of the, the native druids started seeing that the Vanyaskin image of production and um, blending together uh, basically nature and and technology to form a more perfect um, a more perfect being, uh, perfectly you know balanced in, in tune with the world, led to a civil war between the two uh, sides, and in the end the. Um, the ones who sided with the Vanyaskin industrialists were the ones who won. So now the divine domain of Vanyaska um, is a basically like an industrial powerhouse, but they're not like, um, they're not like, you know, as much of like, hey, you know, let's build lots of airships and tanks and stuff. It's a lot of using cybernetics to enhance existing things, but like doing it nature themed. So, for example, it's really common for, like, um, all, all citizens of, of the domain uh, get implanted with a cybernetic, basically, shortly after birth, um, called, uh, called the Sacred Root, which acts as the, um, the baseline, um, your baseline cybernetic in your spine that future cybernetics can sync up with as you grow older. And so all of their cybernetics are styled off of like vines and plants and animals and stuff. So they've got this nature, nature punk aesthetic for everything. And so like they'll enhance animals till they uh, basically, you know, give them, uh, you know, better sensors or like, you know, armored skin and stuff to be able to help survive better. And so uh, I'm working with my players about making a subclass for them called the Circle of Transcendence which is all about being a Vanyaskin uh, techno-druid. Um, so she's allegedly the fifth god, but the problem is she acts in a way that is very, like, soul-focused. Like, she is all about efficiency and industry. And so she doesn't have a lot of the 
rounded, softened edges that the Tetrarchic gods have at this point after 500 years. And so she is not officially sanctioned. However, Von Yaskins are very prized in um, some of the other civilizations because they're just really good at working with technology and like factories and stuff. So in, um, in the main most advanced civilization called the United Federation of Allied States, uh, Von Yaskins are tolerated as a very weird, like, religious minority, but, you know, there's no active, like, oppression or anything by them, um, towards them. Um, so that's the fifth god. And then the other belief systems are, if you've played, if you've watched my streams of Eberron Ashes of the Last War, um, or anything else where I've talked about goblinoids before, um, I have a very specific, like, goblinoid um, like social system I've developed about how they work as a very communal meritocracy style um, culture. And so um, they don't venerate the Tetrarchy as a whole. Uh, generally, the goblinoid system is to, they believe basically in direct ancestor worship. So when, um, when your clan that you're born into and everything, uh, when somebody dies in that clan, their spirit just like, goes to a special zone where they watch over and guide um their descendants and so that is that is their basic belief system so they're always interconnected to each other um <laughs> and um they and so they, they always believe that you know you live to serve your clan everything in goblinoid society is very structured towards um putting the clan above the self um, and so, like, you know, people get jobs and stuff that the clan, uh, can basically help direct them towards so that they can be able to advance the clan, you know, politically, uh, influence-wise or just economically, uh, by giving it more skill sets and etc. The Goblinoid Society as a whole is a, di a diaspora throughout all the different continents because their original homeland was destroyed about 500 years ago in an event called uh, The Desolation, which I haven't... I want to give it more of a term, but I haven't made up what the Goblin homeland is called. Uh, but the original uh, homeland was destroyed, and so they've kind of spread uh, throughout the rest of the continents and formed very important um, pillars of a lot of societies because, you know, Goblinoids are a very cohesive, connected people, and so they generally function really well in societies um, and can integrate well um, into the, the overall uh, parent society. Then um, the, the next uh, faith system is... Uh, so in the past, there were two great civilizations that resided in the world. Um, there, is, uh, there was the Wayfarer civilization, and then there was a Draconic civilization. Nobody knows why the Draconic Civilization collapsed, but it also did at the same time that the Wayfarer Civilization did. And uh, they, um, the, the true dragons, which formed kind of the core of the civilization, became less and less. Um, so, at, uh, however, they're, like any reptilian race in the world is basically, it's a Draconic race um, as far as the world uh, lore is concerned. So lizard folk, Yanti, dragonborn, kobolds, all those things are are uh, draconic races, um, and so they believe in a basically a connection with um, the magic flow of the universe, kind of like the weave in Forgotten Realms. Basically, believing there is magic energy in everything in every person, and when you die, you just become a part of of the magical flow of the of the multiverse, kind of thing. No, dinosaurs would also be included as a draconic race. Um, and turtles. Dragon turtle turtles, come on. Practically sells itself. Um, and so those are like the big, uh, the big religions. Many civilizations in the world have um, like regional variations. Uh, yeah, like chakra, key, the force, all that kind of stuff. It's very much like just a flow of existence um, that connects everything. Um, and then, um, there, uh, there are civilizations that have different 
aspects of the Tetrarchic faith. So, for example, there is a civilization that's called the Solari Empire, or the Empire of the Solar Phoenix, which is called Solari for short. Um, they uh, they venerate the Tetrarchy, but they specifically place um, Turbida as their highest goddess, um, and they they view her cycle of life and death, though, more as um, a specific version of reincarnation, where basically when you die, your soul gets kind of put into a pool. <laughs> um, and um, when somebody new is born, they're created by mashing up the, you know, bits and pieces of dozens, hundreds, thousands of souls all together. So every person is an embodiment of the legacy of everyone who has come before them. And so um, that is their specific version of how the how Terminus faith works there and why they uh why they specifically choose her more than um they don't it's not like you embrace death like nobody wants to die however you accept that um you know when you die you're just becoming you'll come back in some way basically through another generation of people um and like in the northern continent uh of the Valkorans uh, they are basically Magical Girl Vikings. <laughs> if you've heard me talk about Magical Girl Vikings before, it's the, it's the Valkorans. I literally made a whole civilization of Magical Girl Vikings. Um, who, uh, they, they're, they believe, um, very much in the, uh, like the Sea of Stars. Um, and, uh, they... They basically are very ast um, astrological and astronomical uh, oriented. Um, yes, there's there's full of femboy giants and dommy mommy giants. That's literally like half their society. Um, <laughs> and so um, they they all believe in stars and everything, and that everybody. That's why they're very into also exploration. Um, and naval stuff is because they're all about exploring the Sea of Stars as the end goal for everything. And so they believe when you die, um, your spirit basically goes into the sky and becomes a new star. Which also means that when meteorites land um, on Nexus, uh, they are incredibly venerated as basically a um, the soul of a great warrior or person um returning to returning to the world once more um and so they take the meteorite and they turn it into something called star steel which is uh basically a magical metal which is highly valued and can be like basically creating its own living legend when you wield it um so they uh venerate specifically cognisius as the god of creativity and invention um, as a explorer, um, who will, like, return them to the stars and everything, as that's the end goal. In the true lore of the setting, the Valkorans are actually descended, um, are actually descended from the original, uh, Void Arc pilots and, like, crew members of the ships that the Planeswalkers took to settle, um, on Nexus, which is why they're so fixated on space um and exploration um and thank you for the resub and why snark exchange you wonderful beans can we have a shout out for them please um i uh so um there th so there is the society it's the valcorans um i'll do like a brief like we're gonna we're gonna talk briefly about like i have a very like shitty map made uh for this because i've been adding new things to it so in the north you got, uh, what is, what is my official title? Because I give all these countries, like, actual names. Um, so we have the... I'm going to scroll through my notes for a moment. Uh, the Valkoran Commonwealth is what they are. So this is the Valkoran Commonwealth. Uh, we're just book common. <laughs> um hey Corey, welcome, welcome. So yeah, the Valcoran Commonwealth in the north, which is my 
my magical girl Vikings with lots of femboys and muscle mommy giants and stuff as a part of their society. Um, and, uh, you know, another just like micro detail about their civilization is they, you know, you have like Viking longhouses, except all of them uh, basically have a glassed over um, like sunroof kind of thing. So you can always have the stars, the sky and the moon looking down at your house, you know, watching over you kind of thing. Um, and then, um, over in the Western continent, you have, we'll say it's here, actually it's a bit bigger. So you got the, the UFAS. So the UFAS is basically a fantasy, um, EU kind of setup. Um, it consists of seven, uh, seven nations that um, have basically integrated into a federation with each other and an external alliance for all purposes. So, at, and uh, they came into true fruition 50 years ago in the timeline um, because they originally were separate nations that all uh, were divided between basically uh, republics, um, republics and then uh, monarchies and empires and dictatorships and stuff. And then they fought in fantasy uh, World War II against each other. And in the wake of that war, um, the the three uh, victorious... Um, no, wait a minute. Uh, I have to do my mental math for a moment. It was uh, the four victorious nations um, basically did uh, a reconstruction where they overhauled a lot of the uh, governments of the defeated nations that were the aggressive, uh, aggressive imperialists and stuff, and turned them into more functioning members of society, and then just started rebuilding them to be fully, fully fledged members of the what was the wartime alliance of the United Federation of Allied States, and extend them to be a part of it. Now, at this point, fifty years later, they're basically full members um, and just adva advanced as the rest of them. They have an overall like 1930s tech level, so they have magic tech, magic, and normal tech. Um, so they've got, for example, like phones and trains and planes and tanks, um, the radio, you know, all that stuff exists in the UFAS and to and guns and to a lesser extent in other nations, but it's at the highest level in the UFAS. So the seven member states of the UFAS are um the uh, Confederatio Umbrio, or Umbria, sorry, which is a confederation of Italian uh, microstates and city states, um, and uh, very Art Deco, uh, lucky. Um, hey, Lily. Oh yeah, I'm just talking about lore stuff. I haven't gotten into campaign specific stuff. So the Confederatio Umbria is basically like if you played Age of Myth I'm not Age of Mythology, if you played uh uh Rise like Rise of Mythology, or I think of Rise of Magic, the the fantasy version of Rise of Nations. Um or what was it? Or something else. I don't remember. Um they are basically like, you know, fucking Da Vinci style Italian city states that are all about, you know, technology and stuff that have, you know, advanced further. And they were one of the victorious bodies, and they work in a um, a council of each state um, as a... Rise of Legends, yes, that was it, um, as their legislative body. There is um, the, uh, the Republic of Lyon, which is a French-themed, you know, republic. Uh, they were also a member of... The, one of the founding members of the UFAS, very much like you know, revolutionary Republican France in, um, in a lot of their background. Um, and then, uh, there was the, uh, the Union of Aura Kalmar, which, uh, the Union of Aura Kalmar is, uh, it's actually a nation that was founded by, um, by Valkorin colonists and settlers. So the, the magical girl Vikings ended up settling on the continent um, <laughs> ended up settling on the continent and basically over the centuries uh, syncretized to
to the rest of the UFAS standard, so they became less Viking and more like IKEA, you know, Scandinavians. Um, but they still hold that very much, uh, you know, uh, cognitious exploration of the stars mentality, but in much more of like an astronomy thing rather than like, we're going to physically go into space uh, and live there kind of aspect that the Valkorans do. And so those were the three original founding members of the UFAS. And then the fourth one um, is... Uh, I, I don't remember what I called it. Um, I don't think I have a fancy name for it yet. Um, but the fourth one is uh, Tirol, which is kind of like an... Uh, Hunger, it's like an Austria-Hungary-Switzerland kind of mix, um, which was basically made by a lot of the, uh, the more minor nations that existed in the UFAS territory binding together, uh, for mutual security. They started off neutral during what was called the Great Liberation War, because the UFAS is all about branding. So, when they, when the victorious powers... Uh, you know, one fantasy World War II, they rebranded it the Great Liberation War because they liberated the defeated nations from their own tyrannical, um, tyrannical systems. And they will use this term a lot in their history, like when they invade Eryxia, it's the Eryxian liberation and stuff. Um, but Tyrol stayed neutral for much of the early years of the war and then ended up joining near the end, um, to basically be on the side of the winners. So then um, I also lived in Switzerland for, for a time. I spent a, a year of college there. Um, so the defeated nations that became a part of the UFAS is the um, the Eisenstadt, which was a German, like an industrial German, uh, like Prussian militarist style nation that was very much a military dictatorship that uh, near the end of the war, the, uh, the, the workers, unions, and socialists rose up and overthrew the government and have since replaced it with a, uh, a basically a socialist syndicalist style regime um, that is all about like industrial um, equality, not like Stalinistic communism, but more of like, yeah, we're trade unions and we're going to work, you know, not to not to be bad guys and exploited. Um, they, in fact, seize the means of production. And if you've seen the art I've done of my hyena, my hyena barbarian girl, she is from the Eisenstadt. She is a soldier from Eisenstadt. Her, uh, her name is Clara, um, and she is one of the brave... Uh, there, it's a lot of merchants, a lot of industrial workers, um, inventors, machinists, and stuff. While, while Umbria is much more about, like, the creative, ex, uh, you know, exploration of technology, uh, the Eisenstadt is much more about practical things and giving, um, yeah, more Catalonia, um, less, less Soviet. And so uh, the Eisenstadt ended up uh, uh, basically having a, an overall socialist revolution near the end of the war which left the two remaining powers to fight out the rest of the war, which was the uh, the then Empire of Kassil. Yeah, function over form, basically. Um, the Empire of Kassil was a Spanish, uh, like very much like Spanish Empire-themed uh, nation um, that after they lost the war, it got uh, reconstructed as the kingdom of Castile and became a basically a constitutional monarchy where uh, the uh, the monarchs are largely just a symbolic, much like actual real Spain. <laughs> um, and that's where, if you've seen the art of my hellhound gun mage girl, Isabella de Valencia, she is from Castile. Um, and then the final, uh, the final nation is the Grand Principality of Avalon. Um, the Grand Principality of Al Avalon is interesting because they went all in on being like relationships with the Fey Queens. So while a lot of other people were like making deals with the Fey because they didn't know any better, uh, like structurally or religiously, the, the, Av the um, Avalonians 
went all in and basically uh, contracted so that half of the soul of every true citizen of Avalon would be given to the Fey Queens, and in exchange, they would be bound to a Fey spirit, which would act as like a fairy godmother kind of thing to them and help empower them. So the whole aristocracy of Avalon was structured around being all about like making uh, like ridiculous deals with the Fey. However, they then took it a step uh, further in their history um, by going Aztec Empire uh, style. And so they would go um, be very expansionist and militaristic, basically defeating and sacrificing people to the Fey Queens um, as, as like a way of gaining their favor and more power. Um, <laughs> and so they were structured under a grand prince because uh, the highest... The highest position in their society was the Grand Prince or Grand Princess because nobody could be a king or queen because that position is uh, saved specifically for the Fey Queens themselves. Um, so, but yeah, so Avalon was the most war criminal of the of the UFAS states. And uh, so when they lost the war, uh, the, the UFAS basically dismantled the whole regime and like basically did like Nuremberg trials for a lot of the Avalonian uh, aristocracy and made so the different uh, Grand Prince, Grand Princess was not nearly as powerful and turning it much more into an oligarchy and uh, basically establishing d discrimination towards their particular uh, views on fake contracts and trying to make them more a traditional tetrarchic society. Um, there are still members of Avalonian society that are like old ways, basically, you know, we should go back to sacrificing people to the queens for power, but they are a, you know, super marginalized uh, minority in the, in the nation. Um, so how did the war end up ending? So the war went on for several years um, and it was very bloody and, you know, very back and forth and destructive. And as it looked like it was going to grind on even longer. Uh, yes, uh, Vesper, there are still um, there are still citizens of Avalon that that continue the tradition of the half a soul contract. Um, but they're a, they're a minority now. They're a big minority. It's it's also like been reframed a lot to not be as problematic. But yeah. There is still a sizable minority of Avalonians that do the half soul contract system and have their fairy godmothers and godfathers. But most Avalonians don't because they never did in the first place. Um, and it was only made even less popular after the war. So you can be like a totally good guy who has a half soul contract because that's largely something that's made by your family like before you're born. Um, kind of, kind of rumple stilt skinny. <laughs> um, and so, uh, the war continued and the UFAS states fighting against the, the other states, uh, got kind of desperate because it looked like this was going to stretch on even further and there'd be more destruction. So they did something which is basically forbidden by, by like tradition in what was the region that became the, the Federation which was they made a deal with a pair of dragons um, who in, in Nexus, dragons are basically like walking nuclear weapons. So there aren't many true dragons left in the world. There's only probably about 200 left. Um, however, each of them is incredibly powerful in their own right. And, peop and governments are very suspicious of them because they are basically a walking you know, super intelligent, hyper magical tank that could destroy whole, you know, cities in a single blast. Um, so uh, they made a deal with a pair of dragons to basically intervene on the side of the Federation during the war. And in exchange, they gave them like basically full citizenship, full power, full rights of autonomy within the uh, the successor 
um, the new the new society that they would create in the wake of it. So these two dragons intervened and destroyed the second most populous cities of both Avalon and Cassiel to finally break them and get them to surrender. And so that's what ended the war. And uh, the two uh, the two dragons continue to live um, in the Federation to this day in uh, in Umbria. Um, and they're actually the moms of one of the, the, the NPC companions, the party recruits. <laughs> and they're going to be one of the main, uh, basically, employers of the party during the campaign. Um, but yeah, basically, the CIA of, of the Federation does hyper-close observation of all dragons within the borders of the country. And make sure that they're, uh, <laughs> and make sure that they, uh, uh, that they're accounted for and that they know what they're doing <laughs> because it is very dangerous, um, for them not to. So there's always CIA agents basically watching and monitoring the dragons who live there. Um, but 99% of the time dragons just exist in like a humanoid form, so... You know, they're kind of, they keep a pretty low profile except being registered with the government. Um, so, yeah, that gives you an idea about the Federation and their relationships. So, next to the Federation is the uh, the now former Majocracy of Erixia. No, oh, that's, that's a bad X. Erixia. Erixia was a mageocracy that was led by a council of wizards, very Thay-esque, um, but like less overtly evil. Um, <laughs> what are they up to exactly? And so, um, in my in my setting, there is a there's a magical mineral called nexite, um, which is the fundamental basis of most like magitech and magical items are made from nexite. Like, gasoline is also made from Nexite. So it's this very important um, fossil fuel, basically. Nobody knows what exactly it's made of. It's it's obviously hyper-magical, but they don't know if it's, like, naturally occurring, if it's, like, uh, basically distilled energy of the plains, whatever. But it is the very backbone of, of civilizations. Um. <laughs> hey, Michael! Welcome, welcome! And so, Erixia was a wizard nation... Uh, that I, I talked about in one of my previous streams is a very hierarchical uh, caste system around who has arcane magic and who doesn't. Um, that is also one of the largest, uh, it's actually the largest um, supply of Nexite in, in the world. And so they were a primary Exite exporter, or Nexite exporter. So 10 years ago, after a series of diplomatic issues between uh, the Ufas and Erixia, uh, the Ufas invaded Erixia to engage in some nation building and overthrow the ruling mageocracy of the Arcane Conclave and turn Erixia into a democracy. However, they did succeed. Um, after, after five years of war, they basically established a new mage-slaying agency uh, that ended up merging with the CIA called the Misericordia. And their job was basically to hunt down wizards in the Erixian government and murder them. Um, because that was the backbone of the Erixian society. So they did that um, in, in what was called Operation Nightfall uh, and proceeded to basically kill off or scatter all of the upper uh, mages of the society. And so then they set up an occupation and reconstruction which was heavily contested by, by many different native factions. And so, in the wake of the Erixian liberation, um, the, the various Federation governments were getting fed up with the cost of occupying Erixia as well as the military commitment it was. So, they set up a, um, they set up a commission that basically contracted out to ExxonMobil to take over the uh, the reconstruction and nation building efforts in Erixia from um, the world's largest Nexite uh, harvesting, 
uh, processing and distribution corporation called um, the Nexus Consortium, or Nexcore for short. And so they basically gave Nexcore uh, the the right to uh, basically manage and reconstruct the place under minimal Federation supervision as long as they uh, were furthering the objectives of the Federation. And so Nexcore has basically turned Arixia into its own private fiefdom, which giving them basically the largest market share control over Nexite deposits in the planet. Um, and they have a private army of, of contractors, which are various mercenary bands, former soldiers, deserters from the old regimes, etc., who act as the troubleshooters in Arixia. But the country is still heavily divided between various factions um, who are each struggling to basically restore Arixia to what they think it should be. Uh, yeah, definitely a good idea to hand over nation building to, to Blackwater slash Exxon Mobil. Um, <laughs> capitalism is the true big bad guy of this campaign and of the world. <laughs> so, uh, in the campaign I'm going to be running... Uh, Nexcore is the primary antagonist and one of their vice presidents. So, beyond Erixia, you get, it's an overall area, which we're just gonna do a big circle. So, this is called the Eastern Marches. Or, slash, the Dragonlands. Oh, I, Dragonlands. This was, um... Allegedly where Draconic Civilization was originally based. Uh, it, because there's a lot of Draconic Civilization, like, remnants there. But mostly the Eastern Marches is a lot of, like, tribal and clan-based, uh, like, nomads or city-state-based um, civilizations that are very disunited. There's basically nothing bringing them together. So it's largely considered, like, you know, this is like the Balkans no man's land of the continent in the eyes of, uh, uh, like most people, the Federation. And then in the north of that, you get, um, the Vanyaskins. So that's the, uh, my, my Russian cyber, you, Vanyaskins. Yeah. Uh, that's where the Russian cyber druids live, um, uh, with their, with their, uh, you know, nature punk civilization. And then to the south, you have uh, the Ravenan Imperium. So the Ravenan Imperium is what uh, this is probably one of my favorite nations because it's from another setting I wrote, and I just thought it was the coolest idea ever. Um, so my pitch for the Ravenan Imperium is. They're a psychic Buddhist Roman Empire. That is, if I had to describe them in four words, it'd be psychic Buddhist Roman Empire. Um, so the uh, Ravenna has been founded largely by psionic races um, who, you know, and the descendants of psionic races. So if you have any psionic ability there, you're, you're automatically uh, basically a citizen. And their religious system, I forgot theirs, uh, they have a very specific religious system, um, which is called the, uh, the Path of Ascension. Um, <laughs> and so the Path of Ascension is basically structured that they believe that every person can become uh, a, a basically perfect. Um, once you're able to master the three uh, the three cardinal, um, like, aspects of, of existence, you have basically reached perfection of, of being and soul. And so they have, it's the, the path of the body, the path of the mind, and the path of the spirit. And so each, each, uh, Ravenin, uh, who has psychic ability begins their journey down the paths most people never really do anything with it. You don't, um, you don't like try and master any of the particular paths. And then those who do actually decide to pursue it usually only do one path and then they never manage to move on further from that. 
And so mastery of the body is basically mastering physical control over yourself. Like, people who've mastered the path of the body can make themselves, like, larger, stronger. Uh, they could, like, reshape themselves, etc. Um, then there's the path of mind, which is all about basically psionic might and, like, you know, telepathy and stuff. And then the path of the spirit is all about psionic, like, weird stuff. Like, being able to, you know, reshape reality and stuff with your psychic powers. Um, and so, uh, their society is entirely hierarchical, where, uh, basically there is a pool of citizens that then moves on to, um, to the, uh, what are they called? Uh, the patricians, who are people who've gone down one of the paths, and then, uh, to a, like, an inner, an inner level of patricians, which are people who have gotten baseline mastery of all three paths, which then goes on to the two consoles, which each have mastered all three paths to a near inhuman degree. And then there's the Emperor, who is somebody who has mastered all of them and is basically a living god because they have such absolute control over themselves and psionic ability. And the only way to advance from being a patrician to, like, the inner council patricians to, um, to, what's it called? Uh, to the consuls is you have to defeat somebody in the tier above you. So in order to become emperor, you have to have killed the previous emperor. And so they're all about basically discipline and perfection is their society. And then they have a lot of, you know, client kingdoms and client states, which are non-citizens and are the auxilia, who don't have the same, like, Path of Ascension stuff. So they have a lot of, you know, tetrarchic people, um, as well as maybe some Vanyaskins, etc. So they are my psychic Romans. If there was a stream where I was drawing the, the Fabuki leg uh, legate from from the Revenans. Um, so if you're basically like a Githyanki, a Githzerai, a Durgar, etc., you're basically a part of the citizenry of Ravenna, most likely. Um, so this is really poor because I used like all the space for it. So that's the north and the central continent, basically. I mean, a uh, western continent. So, then, below, we'll say this is the Ufas continent. Up here, below them, you got a um, an archipelago, which is called the, let me check my notes, uh, which is called the, do do, the Argent Union, which is a, um, it's a twin state. This has been not Europe. <laughs> yeah, that was not Europe. So this is the Argent Union. So the Argent Union is a twin state that is made up of both the Argent Union itself, as well as um, the the Crescent Isles of Trados. And uh, hey, Sif, welcome, welcome. So the... Um, the Argent Union is basically a a mercantile slash piracy uh, confederation, um, and it uh, it consists of mage rights and mages who specialize in using uh, nexite infused lore. I mean, ore and trees from their mountain islands to forge great like magical ships, um, and. While these kind of ships are no longer practiced in the UFAS itself, Libertalia, I don't know what Libertalia is, um, they, uh, they basically are super magical ships, as opposed to the Indomitable class of steel and Nexite reactor ships that, uh, that are used in the Federation. Um, but they're still very capable, they're just not as good, but when used properly, they can be just as good. Um, so... Argenti ships are used by a lot of other nations as, like, their mainstay of their navies and stuff. Um, and the, um, and their particular god that they venerate in the Tetrarchy is obviously Cognisius, who's all about invention and creation. Um, 
Oh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, and so they have basically 50% pirate oligarchy, 50% merchant prince oligarchy, um, acting as, like, the, sh the, the legitimate shield of the Union. Um, the Federation has tried to basically uh, liberate, quote-unquote, the Argenti, but it's always proven too difficult because of how the archipelago is set up and their various weather witches known as the, the sirens. Gender, gender neutral term, sirens, who are like mages and druids and stuff, who specialize in manipulating the seas and skies and stuff around the Argenti uh, archipelago. So you got them. Then um, to the east. We're going to shrink this. So to the east of um, of the continent with the Federation, you have the uh, this area is divided oops, divided between this is the desolation. I keep hitting my erase button. All right, desolation. So that's the desolation. That's the the goblinoid um, homeland, and then uh, just for simplicity, you got this. So you have. Uh, the Empire of the Solar Phoenix, which is all about fire and believing, uh, basically the sun. It, it uses kind of like um, kind of like Egyptians, where the sun is like a it, when it sets, it's reborn each day. That goes with their reincarnation beliefs. So they believe the sun is a is basically a super powerful phoenix that exists that uh, is reborn every day um, to to you know, be the sun. <laughs> um, and so they're kind of, they're not like super, like um, what would be like an East Asia analog. They do have some commonalities, but it's more of just, that's their shtick is about reincarnation and fire. <laughs> um, and then to the west of Siracod, I mean, uh, uh, the west of the solar Phoenix is Siracod. So Seer Akkad, which is actually a reference to uh, uh, my only Pathfinder character I've ever played was a, a cleric of Saran Raid named Cyrus Alakadi. Um, and uh, <laughs> profession be in the sun. And Seer Akkad is kind of like a Middle Eastern uh, style theme. I am the Goth Knight GF. I am both the Goth Knight and the Goth Knight GF. And so Siracod is kind of like a Middle Eastern style thing, but it's themed off of storms, uh, music, and gems. Uh, so their their shtick is very much about um, basically uh, the the nature of the the flight of spirit throughout uh, throughout life. And so they're big into like storm and wind magic and everything, and the notes of and, you know, basically the harmony and notes of life is very musical and song oriented. So, like, they have a very, very, very strong bardic tradition in, in Siracod. Um, and then they, they love using um, basically gem-based uh, musical instruments, which sounds weird, but that's how it works. They've managed to figure out how to project sound through, through minerals and stuff to create specific resonances. Um, he was a Kenku Druid of Vermin. You'll love to see it. Crow boy. Um, so yeah, so that's the Eastern Continent. And then to the South is... This is um, the... It's made up of... There's a lot of different member states, but the main... Uh, the main state is the Kingdom of Renor, which is going to be featured in a future Nexus campaign that I do one day. Um, so the Kingdom of Renor is a very interesting civilization that I haven't totally fle fleshed out, but <laughs> they form the largest part. So we'll say like they're that of the Southern Continent. Um... And then everything else is just a lot of member, uh, like smaller states. Um, so that gives you a rough idea about the setup of the world itself. Um, so now we're just going to talk about uh, some of the, the the fun things that exist in Nexa, uh, Nexus. 
Um. <laughs> yeah, the sandbox is definitely there. Um. So, in Nexus, um, because of the like nature of the fact that Nexus is founded by planeswalkers and everything, everybody is basically you're either from a plane. Or you were a, way, uh, a Wayfarer successor person. So people like humans and dwarves and uh, mo and halflings and stuff, those were all like Wayfarer successor races. Orcs, um, orcs, goblinoids, etc. Now, there is a huge chunk of races which are not, uh, strictly speaking, Wayfarer successor races, which are the fae descended races. Because when the when the world was real thin barriers with the rest of the planes, a lot of fey uh, would settle on the world, and so a lot of races I've put into one of the five different uh, fey courts that exist in my setting. You have the seasonal courts of summer and winter. You have the wild hunt of King Oberon. You have the void court of uh, Queen uh, Queen Morgana, the the Raven Queen. And then you have the Urban Court of Fae, um, led by Pumpkin Jack. And so Pumpkin Jack is actually the... The Urban Court is the youngest uh, Fae court, comparatively. Um, and then the Seasonal Courts and the Void Court are the are the oldest, with the, the three queens of the Fae being, triple, uh, being triplets that I've, I've drawn um, some of them before on stream. Um... Queen Mab of the Winter Court, Queen Titania of the Summer Court, and then Queen Morgana of the, uh, who is the Raven Queen, who usually just goes by the Raven Queen. Um, the King of Rap, yep, exactly. Uh, so here's the breakdown of races, uh, by Fae Court. So, you get, um, you do, got them in my notes. Okay, so, uh, half- uh, half elf is kind of just a catch-all race for anybody who's, you know, basically part fey, um, and like part anything else. Um, there's the seasonal courts consist of a ladrin are basically like, they're like true fey from the seasonal courts, while high elves are like a ladrin that became mortal. Um, high elves, forest gnomes, rock gnomes, fairies, satyr, and... Uh, the fur bogs in my setting are called nightshades, and they're actually plant people. Um, they're all, like, nine-foot-tall Amazonian plant people. Like, Zyra from League of Legends is a race. Uh, <laughs> and so those are all season court lineages. All right, Lucky. Well, thank you for coming by. I appreciate it. I hope you had fun. Um, the Void Court of Fae uh, consists of Shatterkai as the true servants of the Raven Queen, Drow as like mortal shot uh, versions of Shatterkai, Changelings, Kenku, obviously, and Deep Gnomes. And then the Wild Hunt's lineage consists of Wood Elves and Centaurs. So, in the wake of the Infinite Eclipse, um, a lot of Fae got stranded on, on Nexus and basically became mortal, while a lot of Fae also just chose to stay on Nexus and become mortal. So, if you're any of those races, uh, you're most likely going to be just the normal mortal version of them. However, there are also true fey versions of them, which true fey are different because true fey don't have souls per se, because they exist as basically um, creations of their plane, like outsiders, like devils and um, demons and stuff. Um... And, uh, so, it is possible for a mortal fey to become a true fey, but it's something very, very few mortal fey ever do, because it literally means you trade your humanity and all of your memories for basically becoming a fey <laughs> and living forever, but also getting all the fey rules that, uh, attach to that. They're like elementals, yeah. So... In the, in the cosmological context of Nexus, you have to remember, Nexus is cut off from the rest of the planes of existence, basically. So the Fey Wilds uh, exists as basically uh, a planar uh, extension of nature and the reflection of it. 
And then the void is kind of the, the roll up of the astral plane, the ethereal plane, and the shadow fell all into one. And then, um, so they exist kind of around the, the material plane of Nexus. And since the, the way it works in my, my cosmology is the Fey Queens, all the Fey beings themselves are actually creations of their planes. So if you have a Fey Wild, you will always produce a, a Queen Titania and a Queen Mab. If you have a void, you will always create the Raven Queen. So the the queens that exist here are not necessarily the the true queens that exist everywhere else. Uh, they are um, they're automatic creations of the, these planes existing here. So once you lose contact with your queen or king, you then generate a new one in in that in that plane. Hey, Dollface! You guys should go check out Dollface. She's a phenomenal artist. She actually did some of the art for Nexus of uh, of our Phoenix Fire Gen uh, Ganassi, as well as she did the Saint of City of 40k art for me. Super great, great to work with. Definitely go send her love. Um. So, uh, yeah. So those are the Fey always exist, uh, which leads to, um, we're gonna be dropping some random Fey lore here. So. Um, I'm also a scourge on society. <laughs> so, you know how I feel about Fae. My Fae are shysty as hell. So, I also am like a huge Fate fangirl. So, I was like, let's take Fate and let's make it D&D. &D. So, in, um, I'll explain how the Raven Queen works specifically for how she, like, is super Fate, but... In, um, in Nexus, there is an event which is called the Twilight Masquerade. So the Twilight Masquerade is a quote-unquote secret event that happens every 13 years in Nexus history. And it is, for all extents and purposes... A holy grail roll, a uh, holy grail war. So the basic idea behind the Twilight Masquerade is your five, you know, your five archfey beings who, you know, just look for stuff for like shits and giggles and fun. Uh, hey, Bobacus, welcome, welcome. And uh, so they basically have a battle royale they organize where each uh, each uh, Archfey picks a, a, a mortal champion, somebody who doesn't currently serve them, and but who's vulnerable to their particular, you know, influences, and they go, hey, I'm going to empower you with superpowers from, from my court for, for this battle royale. And if you win, you get to get a no-strings-attached pact with one of the Fey, uh, one of the Arch Fey. So, you know, they'll basically give you exactly what they, what you want that is within their power to do. So if you want to live forever, cool. They give that to you with no strings attached. Like they won't have some horrible, you know, monkey's paw, you know, trade off for it. It's like, no, nope, this is your, this is your victory. You get one thing of your choosing, but you have to kill the other four champions um, to, to be able to, to get it. And it's literally exists purely so the Fey, uh, Arch Fey can flex on each other. And so it's kept secret, um, directly by like the Federation government and a lot of the governments, um, around the world because the Federation doesn't like wanting people to know that they can basically get superpowers from the Fey if they do a battle royale that destroys a city. <laughs> Um, so the government actively tries to suppress knowledge about these things existing. And once they gather enough intelligence to figure out where the one specific town, city, or region is going to be the site of the next Twilight Masquerade, they basically try to cut it off from the rest of its area until the, until the, the masquerade is over. Um, so to limit collateral damage. Um, 
And so it is obviously illegal if you get caught participating in a Twilight Masquerade, but, you know, there's not much they can do about it. <laughs> um, especially if you win. And part of why it's called a Masquerade is once you take on being the champion of your Arch Fey, you get basically a mask project uh, projection that is themed off of your Arch Fey that is visible to the other uh, Masquerade participants. <laughs> you helped me be petty. There's no higher gift to me. Take this reward. Yep. So each Archfey will empower it in different ways. And we were talking to Lily about, you know, Lily was like, man, I want to make a character who is the survivor of one of these masquerades who's trying to figure out what the fuck happened to their hometown and why it got destroyed and everything. And I'm like, Lily, you've literally just described Shiro Emiya at the start of Fate Stay Night. <laughs> And, and she was like, oh shit, <laughs> I did. Um, so, but yeah, so that's the Twilight Masquerade, which is a Holy Grail War, but in Nexus. So this leads to now um, explaining how I was able to get heroic servants into, into Nexus, into D&D. So in Nexus, all souls, all souls go into the void. They go into the void when they die. And for thousands of years, that was perfectly fine. Souls would go into the void. Now, you know, the void is run by the Raven Queen. <laughs> Some old guy keeps moving town after their town keeps mysteriously exploding every 13 years. <laughs> um, so the Raven Queen basically... Because she's a crow, I love just really amping up her crow nature. Like, she's obsessed with collecting things, collecting shinies. So she's a hoarder. She's a big hoarder. Um, and so she would basically collect all the souls that would die and go to the void and store them in her Tower of Memory. Just basically like a Pokemon master. She had to catch them all. She doesn't really... Just, takes them because she likes having them. Also because in the Shadowfell, like, sensation and, like, feelings don't really exist, so she kind of feeds off of the experiences and emotions of those who've died. So this existed for a very long time. Then 500 years ago, as I said, the gods re-emerged into the world, and the goddess Termina, the goddess of the cycle of life and death, had a big cosmological battle against the Raven Queen, which she won, and so it she struck a deal with the Raven Queen that no longer could the Raven Queen just take people's souls and store them in her tower, but instead she had to act as basically the, 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 the traveler of the soul. So the soul goes to the void, and then the Raven Queen's servants direct that soul to Termina, the goddess of, the de uh, goddess of death and life, to then go to whatever their afterlife or reincarnation or whatever is, so, the Raven Queen is not happy about this because she feels like she's being deprived, obviously, because she's a fey. So, anytime she doesn't get what she wants, she's resentful. Um, so, she likes to take a small portion of every soul that enters the void and store them in the Tower of Memory. Just a small portion of them. And so, these, uh, these like, you know, memories of souls can... Uh, be used by the Raven Queen's servants when she so chooses, uh, when they further particular goals of her. And so, when a servant is selected, uh... <laughs> well, it's because that is literally the ending of Fate Zero, Lily. Um, just a little soul is a treat. When a servant is selected, they're called a Nevermore. And so, a Nevermore then gets assigned... A, uh, the, the fragment of somebody's soul temporarily called an echo. Um, so an echo is basically a heroic spirit. It is the, it is a portion of the soul of a great hero, villain, monster, whatever, which now gets brought back to this world and attached to someone else to basically supplement them in fulfilling their duties. However, it's not like a true servant, a uh, heroic serv uh, spirit from fate, because it's not like a person. 
who fights and stuff on their own. Rather, it's more like a Persona from Persona, where it gives- it's a person you can talk to in a, like, manifested magical form, but then they ultimately enhance your own abilities by giving you, you know, aspects of their own strength, capability, and portfolio to enhance whatever your own abilities are. Um, and so that is your echo um, that you were given. And so during a Twilight Masquerade, the way that the Raven Queen superpowers her particular champion is by assigning them an echo. Fate mentioned, hey, small and strong. Welcome, welcome. Can we have a shout out for everybody's favorite well-hung cat boy? <laughs> so yes, I, I took Fate plus Persona and added it to D&D. So enjoy, enjoy. Um, literally the thing I'm most proud of is making it, is making fate in fucking D&D. <laughs> don't, don't believe his claims to a small peepee. -pee. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. <laughs> small and hung indeed. Um... So, uh, but yeah, so that's, uh, so that's some of that. Time to shamelessly steal this. <laughs> there will be some echoes that will, that will cameo into this campaign. Um, so look forward to that. Also, any support you can send Small is great, A, because he's very funny, but B, he's, he's getting up there in those partnership numbers. So you want to help him hit partner and see just... The biggest masochistic kitty ever. You know, definitely go send him some love. Um, his streams are very funny and it's great watching him watching him cry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so so that's my my fate in D&D thing. Now we're going to talk about some... Uh, we're going to also talk about, since we talked about the Raven Queen and we talked about Echoes, we're going to talk about how the... Um, how spirits work in... Um, work in nexus i get it small i'm just telling you know you're gonna get 75 when i tell people to go watch you <laughs> um so there are obviously issues with you know spirits and stuff and undead in nexus now there's a solution to this so the raven queen she loves catching them all she loves collecting spirits so she was not going to tolerate people coming back undead or being a ghost who haunts an area or something. Um, basically deny her what's her due. So she empowered uh, five people. So there's five ravens is what they're called. So there are five ravens and out of that there are the four cardinal ravens. Each raven is basically a specific inherited position that is descended from one of the spiritual beings that exists in the void serving um, serving the Raven Queen. And these are mortal descendants of those who have each been given a specific weapon from the Raven Queen, which super empowers them to, to hunt down the souls, uh, the lost souls, and uh, basically uh, um, undead and stuff that exist in the world and return them to the eternal cycle of life and death. Um, they, they then work, you know, if you've ever watched Avatar The Last Airbender, each raven is basically also an avatar where the weapon that they, um, that they use contains the soul of every previous raven who wielded it. Um, who are then supposed to act as basically mentors and uh, and guides um, to the new raven who happens to be wielding it. So how do you find out you're a raven? Well, there's specific families that are descended from the ravens, um, and not every member of that family is a raven. Basically, when once once a generation a raven is born, and they're born immediately after one of the previous ravens dies. And so when a new one is born, they're born with a specific set of features. They've got white hair with black streaks in it, and they've got silver eyes in black sclera. 
and pointed ears. All all ravens have that in common. And they're born stillborn. So they are technically dead on arrival. However, once they're born like this, they then get basically they they get bonded to the weapon of their of their raven dynasty, and once they get bonded to it, the raven queen brings them back to life in exchange for them now becoming a raven, and also she takes something from them forever as a part of the deal. Because the crow always has to give, uh, you always have to give her something in return if she gives you something. So for example, the, uh, the raven of the west, she lost the ability to laugh. She cannot laugh anymore. <laughs> that was what the raven queen took from her. Um, so it's usually something that seems pretty arbitrary, but she always has to take something. And so there are five ravens, four cardinal ravens. The cardinal ravens are each in charge of one of the four continents. So in the west, you've got the white raven. The white raven is in charge of the western con continent, including uh, the Euphas, um, Eryxia, the Vanyaskins, the Ravenans, and the Eastern Marches. She uses a large uh, Executioner's Greatsword called um, Deliverance as her, her raven weapon. Uh, she took her funny bone, but she didn't take her funny boner. Lol, lol, lol. <laughs> um, there is the Golden Valkyrie, which is currently a man. The current actively serving uh, Valkyrie Raven is a guy, but they all wear uh, the female armor of, of, the, of their predecessors. There's the Golden Valkyrie of the North, the Pale Rider, Pale Rider of the East, who is uh, like a, a horseman uh, archer type, like Mongolian. <laughs> and then there is the Silver Spider of the South. So the Golden Valkyrie uses a spear, the Pale Rider uses a bow, the Silver Spider she uses basically has twin, uh, twin bladed claws on each of her hands and feet, there would, therefore it's a reference to eight legs. And so they are the Cardinal Ravens and they have jurisdiction over each continent. And hey Scarth Maharg, welcome welcome, we're talking lore. And then in charge of the oceans, is the ferryman who is a non-cardinal uh raven he has jurisdiction over like all the seas and like sailors and stuff who die and ghost ships and all that kind of stuff um and he uses a big magic ore as his weapon so all of them i chose symbols of death from different like cultures and stuff um to be to be each raven and so um i and i drew on stream uh, one of the, uh, I drew the spider raven, the currently serving one. I'll, I'll, I'll flash some art for you guys, since I've done a little bit of it. Scar, thank you for the two, uh, the, the tier two 27 months running. That is fucking incredible. I love it. Thank you so much, Scar. You are a true pillar of this community. Um, where is my sexy spider lady? She's got big tits. That's a, it's a standard operating procedure for all things Obsidia. Why can't I find her? Give me one second. I have a lot of black and white art, so it's like trying to find which black and white art. You know. You know. Oh, there she is. The spider Raven. So I, I gave her her little spider feature, which is the four eyes. So that's the so that's the currently serving silver spider of the south. <laughs> you have little that narrows it down. <laughs> I'm actually getting art commissioned of uh Yeah, I'm actually getting art commissioned of the silver spider by the artist who did my my really cool Zenobia dark fantasy art that I really like. Um so that is her. Also, if you want the art I did of Queen Mab the the queen of the winter court so i need to redo my raven queen um since i did such a better job making making mab <laughs> but this was like the base design 
of the Raven Queen. Since they're they're triplets, they all use the same base design. They just look different. Um, so everything in the in the void is black is basically grayscale except for their their purple eyes um, and like purple tattoos and stuff. So then we're gonna open um, the the white raven of the west. Where is Veronica? Here we go. We got Veronica Corvinius, who is the current uh, White Raven of the West. This art was done by the wonderful Spooky Bean many years ago because I wanted to play this as a character. Now I just made it a fundamental part of the lore of my my D and D setting. <laughs> so that's Deliverance, her executioner's greatsword. Um, but yeah, so each raven is, uh, is very powerful. Um, however, you know, they obviously can't do everything on their own because there's only one of them. So there is, um, <laughs> well, the raven of Aurora is part of the world. Yep. Oh, Dalton Face, thank you for subscribing. I hope you enjoy those sweet, sweet Obsidia emotes. You're such, you're such a wonderful bean. Um, so under each raven, uh, like, the different nations of the world have these people called talons. And talons are the real, the real grunt work of, of ensuring that spirits are delivered to the eternal cycle. So, like, while a raven has jurisdiction over a continent, talons form their own, like, sub-hierarchy um, that they get their power from a raven, but they can never interact with a raven at all. Like, you know, you could be a Talon your whole life and never have seen a raven ever, but you, they are your direct power source. It's kind of like, they're an unwilling warlock patron is basically a raven. So, Talons are like on like county, city, like state level, and they form the real day-to-day -day ghost busting and undead slaying, um, like, aspects of the enforcing of the cycle of life and death so for example every boat that goes sailing on the ocean has a ferryman talon who is assigned to it to be there you know to basically fight ghost pirates and to help uh deliver the last rites kind of thing of anybody who dies on the ship etc so those are the ravens and their talons so that leads into talking about the um, the specific like burial practices that are most common um, across across the world of Nexus. Hey, Vicky, welcome, welcome. So um, in Nexus, there are regional burial beliefs that are tied to each of the different, basically the ravens that have jurisdiction over it. So. These burials, you know, there, there are variations on them um, in, like, a cultural aspect. Yeah, uh, Dollface, she can find things funny. She just physically cannot laugh about them. Um, so, uh, each of these burial rituals is basically designed to help uh, appease the Raven Queen. Um, to help your soul work its way through the void uh, with minimal molestation to get to the goddess Termina. So each of these regional burial beliefs is themed off of their particular raven. So in the West, it's tradition that when someone dies, uh, that the body, if possible, is given two feathers, kind of like the coins you would put over the eyes of somebody in ancient Greece. So you would bury or cremate or whatever the body of somebody with two feathers, preferably crow or raven feathers, um, as basically a sign of deference to the raven queen and it is acknowledgement of the white raven um, helping spiritually escort you through the void. Um, in the south, it's a tradition that when someone dies, you... Uh, you make them a burial shawl or like a uh, cloth that is woven for that purpose. And preferably it has a spider motif on it, which is to symbolize the web of an arachnid, uh, basically covering the soul of the departed um, to protect them on their journey uh, through the void. 
In the North, it's tradition to give the body some form of weapon, whether that be just something as simple as like a kitchen knife or as elaborate as like a full weapon and armor of war, um, to symbolize uh, protecting their soul from the dangers of death as the Valkyrie flies them through the void. And then finally, in the East, it is tradition to have the body uh, travel aboard a horse or other animal for some distance. This can be as simple as across town or for more elaborate burials across like whole regions or countries. And this is to symbolize the spirit riding with the pale rider across the void to get to get to their afterlife. So those are some of the, the regional burial rituals that are tied to the different ravens and the two uh, into like the tetrarchy. Um, so that gives you a, like a real rough overview of stuff. The setting also has power armor and airships and shit, if you were wondering, um, and guns. <laughs> so I, I put everything that's cool into one setting. Um, so now we're going to talk about my upcoming campaign. So Nexus, Forlorn Legacy. So obviously my campaign setting is called Nexus. I'm going to show you the logo if you hadn't seen it already when um, when uh, I was advertising for the stream. So this was made by the wonderful uh, Bunny Bearish. Um, I've got the, uh, the Art Deco text for Nexus. And then Forlorn Legacy is the title of the campaign, which is this really cool... Horizon Zero Dawn rusted metal uh, script that she worked with me. Um, and uh, that is one of the big themes of the setting, I mean, um, of this campaign specifically, is going to be the true nature of what Nexite is, what the gods are, and uh, all that entails. So the symbol is basically it's a Nexite heart being being harvested by industrial industrial bullshit and so that gives you some of the messaging behind what is the theme of the campaign um delicious delicious nexite rock <laughs> um so in the campaign i have four wonderful players already already set up they've actually been set up for like about like a year at this point six months or so and they all have wonderful characters. Um, they all have wonderful characters. Uh, there is Lily is playing Aurora, who is a satyr bimbo wizard painter who made a dark deal with the Raven Queen in exchange for artistic ability. There is Soleil, who is a half tiefling, half fae uh, blood hunter who is from the wild hunt of the fae who is actually the son of the Hound Master of the Fae, um, otherwise known as the Bargast. And he is a big, dumb, uh, trans mask blood hunter <laughs> who is uh, on his quest for vengeance on the Material Plane. It is his first time really coming to the Material Plane. Um, uh, yes, Orange Juice, welcome, welcome. Next site is basically... The magical mineral that is for everything in the world. You make gasoline out of it. You make magical weapons out of it. You make gunpowder out of it. Everything. It is the omni super super mineral of the setting. Um, you have Soleil. Then you have Nafisa, who is a dragonborn uh, step nomad, heavily themed off of uh, Turkic step nomads, who is on a big shonen protagonist adventure. And then finally, you have uh, you have uh, Feng Chen, who is uh, B's character, which is a half hobgoblin, half minotaur um, artificer, who is who is on her own particular uh, journey of advancement and cybernetics. <laughs> so those are my players. Um, and now we're going to walk through who are the different companions they're going to recruit over the course of the campaign. Ew. Bam. So these are the headshots of the different compa NPC companions. For those of you who don't know, in my D&D campaigns, um, I have a mechanic called NPC Companions. 
It's something that I've done a bunch of times and I find that players really like it. Where I, I make four NPC characters that are recruited over the course of the campaign that whenever the party will go on a specific like mission or combat thing basically, they can pick one of their companions to accompany them and basically supplement the skills and powers and stuff that they have. And it gives them an opportunity to RP off of somebody and to grow off of somebody too and stuff. So, in um, Ashes of the Last War, which is my Eberron campaign, it was Larissa Stormtalon, the Harpy Bard, Ashar and Solace, the uh, Changeling Assassin, um, uh, Sylvana, um, Sylvana Lael, the Human Artificer, and Kai Shen Zhao, the Hobgoblin uh, Battlemaster. Now in this, I said, those were all real safe picks. I'm going to go off the fucking deep end with these options. So... These companions are Omega. Uh, Omega is here. Omega is a non-binary because they use they, them pronouns because they're literally uh, a plural entity. Omega is a sentient nanomachine swarm from the ancient Wayfarer civilization that the party is going to recruit, who is now awakened in the modern world after a couple thousand years and is trying to figure out what their original purpose was and everything because they have amnesia. And so that is their that is their non-binary form. There is also a female form called Alpha that the party will unlock. Uh, I mean, the party will meet. Sorry. Um, the party meets later on because they're going to unlock the different identities of Omega over the course of the campaign. So that's Alpha. Um, and so... Omega is... Yo, Brainbuster, thank you for the resub. You'll love to see it. And thank you for the follow, Orange Juice. Welcome, welcome. So, um... Omega is basically... It's a it's a communal consciousness nanomachine swarm that can reshape their body into different, like, weapons and, uh, like, tools and stuff. That's why they're an astral hands monk. As they proceed to disassemble people on a molecular level, that's why they do force damage. With their unarmed attacks and so omega is the compromise between the male and female identities the female identity is alpha and the male identity is sigma because i had to make the joke um so they're going to recruit uh omega um during the campaign then there is lunaseal varnavorna that is his full first name Lunaseal Varnavorna is a literal dragon. He is an 18-year-old dragon. Like, not a dragon years. In literal years, he is 18. So he is a wormling dragon who is on his, um, his Goku Shonen protagonist arc because he's young, dumb, and doesn't know any better. He just turned 18. Ooh, ooh. And so he's traveling the world. Um, he's traveling the world trying to be a big hero champion of justice. And and fight big bad guys and stuff and prove that he's the very best. <laughs> they grow up so fast. Yep. So he is half adamantium, half mithril dragons, which are uh, which are two, uh, two dragon types in my setting. He is very young and very dumb and very naive. Total himbo. And if you were wondering, that, uh, that tooth on his earring is his baby tooth that his... He has a pair of moms, because if you're a sufficiently magical, like, creature in, in Nexus, you basically can reproduce by taking a portion of each soul of the two creatures and combining them together to make a new one. So he has two lesbian dragon moms. Um, and uh, Cherry Boy detected indeed. And so his moms made him an earring of his baby tooth. <laughs> And he's just a big, big doofus. He's seven foot tall, big, muscular, very chuny, has a cape and everything. Um, the boy, he is the boy. Like he's 100% anytime he walks into a room, he's going to throw back his cape and introduce himself, introduce himself as a champion of justice. <laughs> Then you have 
This is a Hellhound Tiefling. So a Hellhound Lineage Tiefling. Her name is Isabella de Valencia. She is a, 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 a Cresselian soldier, which is why she's got this really cool uh, uniform that I designed. Um, and she is a gun mage, which is a class from Iron Kingdoms. But basically, she's a sorcerer that uses guns to, to like magically enhance them. And so she is a big tomboy, you know, big tomboy soldier girl with, uh, with a lot of PTSD and survivor's guilt from her time uh, fighting in the um, fighting in the Erixian Liberation. And I also commissioned art of her by the wonderful Maru. Let me find it. You want some? That's a that's a picture of her her full body in her full uniform, uh, with her specialty lever action revolver uh, rifle that I made her. <laughs> and so she is Isabella de Valencia. She is a uh, caballero capitan uh, in the Castilian military who has ended up joining um, uh, Misery Cord after um, after serving um, in the Erixian liberation and occupation. And she will also be the assigned uh, mi uh, Misery Court operative in charge of supervising Lunas. So Lunasiel Varnaborna goes by Lunas for short. A, because you don't want to advertise to everyone you're a dragon. But B, he also, it's much easier for uh, most people to say than his full draconic name. Yep. I actually drew uh, art of her. So, fun fact as well, I designed all of these characters. These are all based off of uh, reference images that I drew um, when I was scheming them. So let me let me find each of their reference image. So one, two, two, three. Where's Omega? Where's that? Where's that dumb sloop? There's Omega. Give it a second. Hopefully it doesn't crash. All right. So these are the original reference images I drew. This is Isabella's. This is the original Isabella. <laughs> um, and then I drew this picture of the ref image for her in casual wear. <laughs> exactly, Brain Buster. So I drew this uh, this casual, uh, casual um, Isabella uh, artwork. So, um, she was served in the Cassilian Tercios, which is the power armor unit of the Cassilian military. She was the, um, she was the Arquebusier of her unit. So that's what the three symbolizes. And that's why in her thing, it's the three. And then she's got a castle with a pair of pikes behind it as the symbol of the, of, uh, Cassil and the Tercios. Um... It. Okay, so is, that's Isabella, big tomboy doggo. She has a big fluffy tail, and look at her ear fluff. And then, finally, we have the most most trauma most trauma NPC out of every campaign. I have to make one of the four companions maximum trauma. So the the last one is Catriona Ryko where she is half Solari, half Vanyaskin. Um, and so, uh, oh yeah, you want the original Lunas ref I drew, and then the original Omega ref, and the original uh, original Catriona ref. So don't worry, Dollface, we're going to get to your art in just a second. I got to show the sweet Dollface art. Hey, Cyan Pleasance Liddell. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Um, so, Catriana is immortal. She is a Phoenix uh, lineage fire ganasi. Um, and she is a Circle of the Stars druid. And so, she's been alive for 500 years, but she doesn't live for 500 years straight. She lives for about 150 and then dies and is reborn and does it all again. <laughs> And so, and she has full memory of each time. So after about four reincarnation cycles, 
Uh, that would be because I, I based Cor uh, Isabella's hair off of Corsica, Zara. Um, so this was all done by Princess Atobe, if you couldn't tell from the, the thing in the center. Um, so, uh, Katriana is on her fourth life cycle, and she has basically adopted nihilistic, uh, approaches to life because of being immortal. She has seen so many horrible things, betrayals, and the futility of heroism that she's basically just kind of like, I'm just now in it to survive and do what's best for me, which is why she's going to start off as an antagonist to the party. Dun, dun, dun! Um, as she starts off as a uh, uh, enemies to lovers, basically, for the party, where she's going to be working as an agent of the Megacorp that is going to be trying to stop the party until eventually she gets betrayed and joins the party and they help her learn to love again. <laughs> so, if you couldn't tell, um, I designed her to have, like, she is a druid, however, I don't have the metal restriction for my druids because I think it's dumb, and also it's the 1930s, so who cares? So, she's just covered in, like, all these piercings, and she's got her fire hair and eyes and stuff. And she is, her body is covered in tattoos, but you can't see them. And she's got her little Triskelion um, necklace that she wears to let you know she's a druid. She also has the downside of this, while this is her present form, whenever she transforms as a star's druid, she actually transforms to her original life cycle form. So she looks much more like a, like an ancient, like, priestess when she goes into full stars mode, where she's got, like, flowing robes and hair and stuff. And so she feels really awkward whenever she has to transform because it it's going back to a version uh, of herself that she hasn't been in many centuries. Oh, yeah. Um, she's covered in, like, various you know, uh, like, tattoos of, like, druidic and, like, ritualistic and Eastern-style stuff all over her body. But I didn't draw any art of that because she wears she wears a suit for her, for her outfit, so it was never really shown. But for you guys in chat, you know that she's actually covered in tattoos. <laughs> so that'll lead us to this banger artwork that Dollface... Uh, that I commissioned Dollface to do of her as she does the Roy Mustang pose from Full Metal Alchemist. Um, and also, my literal favorite thing that I gave Catriona is she has flame ember fucking freckles. I just think it's the cutest thing ever. So, but yeah, that's how Catriona looks normally. She's without her full suit and stuff. Once again, artwork done by the beautiful doll face. <laughs> so, but yeah, she'll join the party. And those are the uh, the four companions. And for like the last six months, my players have been doing nothing but making memes and stuff about each other's characters and about these companions and everything. And it's very exciting. So now we move to the antagonist, of the primary antagonist. Because a lot of the campaign is going to be about um, exploration and exploring the different cultures and stuff of the world. Um, so I can basically drop in that for people since it's my first time running a campaign in it. So... What uh, was the original, the original concept uh, art I did of this character? Where are you saved? There we go. There we go. So that was the original concept art for this character. So the primary antagonist of the campaign is uh, an employee of, of Nexcore, you know, the fantasy Exxon Mobile Corporation, uh, who she is the uh, vice president in charge of the department. The Department of Innovative 
Resource Solutions. Resource Solutions or the DRS, the DIRS. So what that entails will be explored during the campaign, but she basically works for the Megacorp and um, she is going to be, for various reasons, the primary antagonist. So she is, uh, if you couldn't tell, she is actually an Azimir. I know I say it wrong, but that is how I will always say it. So she is an Azimir. So she has a, a celestial lineage, which is why she's got this half, um, this half halo and all of these gold, uh, like aesthetics to her eyes and lips and stuff. And her eyes are going to be these th like multiple kind of silver kind of thing. Um, and so she is the vice president. And she's an Azimir who, you know, is very much the, the Dami Mommy uh, Mega Corpo. And this is going to be, she's going to be the character that I commissioned Dollface to draw next. Because I think, I think Dollface could really do her justice. Or also, just look at her, look at her little fangs. I love her. I love her. She's like such a banger design. I love everything about her. <laughs> oh, look, she's a banger design. This design I made about me. Um, yeah, it's supposed to look sort of like a, like a crescent moon, basically. <laughs> so, um, her name is Angelica. Angelica Delaney. His design is bussin'. Um, so this is Angelica Delaney. She doesn't have a left arm in this picture because I couldn't get the perspective right, but she does, and it has her wedding ring because she's actually married to a centaur, uh, a centaur night girl that she met when she was in a refugee camp, and so they're very much in love. She may be, she may be evil capitalism, evil capitalism, but you know she also love. She's a huge simp for her gay wife. Gay horse wife. <laughs> so, her and her centaur girlfriend. Yeah, her she has a hot centaur wife that she is madly in love with. Um, even if she's an evil corpo, she she always will love her wife. We've already talked about. <laughs> you should both be my magnum opus. <laughs> We've talked about how there's going to be a Hot Springs episode in this campaign. Like, I had the beach episode in Ashes of the Last War. There's going to be a Hot Spring episode where they're going for, uh, uh, to basically the party and their companions and stuff. And then simultaneously, Angelica and her wife will be doing a wedding anniversary at the Hot Spring as well. And it'll be a time for them to not fight each other, but just, like, be, be vibing in the same space, basically. <laughs> So, but yeah, so that's Angelica, the primary antagonist of the campaign, the servant of Nexcore, um, and vice president of the Department of Innovative Resource Solutions. So I hope you guys like her as much as I like her. I I literally was one day, I was just practicing. Um, where is it? I was just practicing, like, drawing, like, faces and stuff. And then I, like, started started working on this, and I'm like, you know, I gotta, one second, I gotta turn stuff off. Uh, nope. It's a line art. I don't know what I did for this. Oh, there we go. I just turn off the color folder. And so that turns off there. This is why you should pay close attention to your, to your folders, because I'm trying to find which one I actually did this on. <laughs> There we go. I found it. Okay. So I was just trying to draw faces. Oh, you want a big Death Knight hug, Yuzu? Okay. Uh, get your hugging utensils ready, everyone, because I'm coming in deep. And a three, and a two, and a four. There you go. A big Death Knight hug from me to you. I hope you enjoyed it.
Um, so yeah, I was practicing drawing uh, like faces and I ended up doing her design. I had like a coat over her shoulders, but it ended up looking too extra when I did it in practice. So that was what we started with. Um, and then I refined it. And so now we, of course we get suspenders. I'm such a slut for like girls with like fucking like a corset, basically waist and suspenders and like excessive belts. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's good old Angelica. Um, second, I gotta see how much is left. Okay. And, um, do, do sorry, wrong screen. So yeah, but she's, they are actually not going to directly fight Angelica as like an end game boss. I will say that at the front. Um, always more belts, more power. I'm glad that you want to make her your magnum opus, dollface. Start thinking about, like, poses and stuff you think would be cool, because I just, I want her and I want you to draw it. That's my two criteria currently. <laughs> um, big gay corpo. Um, I also thought it was interesting having an Azimir who's the bad guy of the campaign. Not for, not for, like, religious cosmic, uh, cosmic reasons, no. She was born in Asmir and she just became a Corpo. <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, so those are the companions and the big antagonists to my, my wonderful players. And so for some of the other NPCs that I'm, I'm putting in it is there is, of course, going to be a busty nine foot tall milk filled cow woman because... I put all of my fetishes and everything. Um, and it's, it's of course, the return of Vicky from, uh, from uh, Mistwalkers. But she's just gonna, since she's my character I didn't get to do much with, she's going to be in this as an NPC. Um, there's also... Um, oh, I got to show this because it is, it is somewhat relevant. Um, there is another character art I commissioned that I didn't get to use for anything, which is being repurposed for this which is this Shatterkai. this is Nethris the Shatterkai, servant of the raven queen you see you see the there's also a character i designed um oh right the bovine babe <laughs> yeah so um she is a an actual true fae servant of the raven queen and she has a pacted bond to Aurora in the party. She is in fact Aurora's goth GF. And so she will be a big player in Aurora's storyline and her relationship to the Raven Queen. And I love her. I love this design. I'm so happy I made her and never got to play her. <laughs> and so this will also lead to a great meme I made about it. To explore the dynamics of, of Aurora and uh and Nethris. I made this me. <laughs> it's literally the two girls in the car. <laughs> oh no, I'm just gonna NTR and run off with a resource. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Nethris is another cameo character. Um, when they eventually work for the dragons, they're gonna have a mobile base of operations that is a like uh like a steam power destroyer called the Durandal, and so I've started, like, fleshing out who are the various uh, crew members of the Durandal. Um, I know that the captain is going to be a uh, a dwarf from the Republic of Lyon, known as René Calais. So she's René Calais de Lyon, and she's going to be a little muscle dwarf French lady. And the, uh, the ferryman on the ship is from Umbria, and he is a mantis shrimp themed triton <laughs> named Giacomo. I don't have art in anything for them. I've just started making the names and uh, personalities of the characters. Start exiting out of some of these. Original, original art. Oh, there we go. So, um, but yeah, in the campaign, the players are basically going to travel around the world, stopping bad guys, meeting weird people from all my different cultures, 
and hopefully having a lot of fun along the way as they fight against capitalism with the power of gays. <laughs> um, and then they'll meet all these wonderful people that they'll try and romance with the best being, of course, a nanomachine swarm because she can make tentacles. Ayo. If only Yulia was playing in this campaign, but she turned me down. <laughs> I was like, there's literally a potential gay girl with tentacles, Yulia. This is specifically made for you. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Whew, I've been talking for like two hours straight. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask about, about Nexus so far? And my stuff for the campaign. I'm gonna look through my other notes of wacky stuff. Do do. Okay. Um, but yeah, so whew, I'm talking a lot. Um, does next site grow back? Nobody knows. You know, much like, you know, early 20th century fucking real life, nobody's quite privy as to how limited fossil fuels are in Nexus. Um, there is a secret that I won't tell you because it will be explained in the campaign about how Nexus works and how more Nexus is made. It is not hard to obtain. It is, it's basically oil slash coal. So it's fairly easy to get um, and refine because it is the, it's like the the ba uh, the basis of like most technology things. Um, the setting is like 1930s orange juice. So like very art deco, you know, there's cars, there's radios, there's, you know, recordings, uh, phones, you know, telephones, etc. Um, so that is of the Federation's technology level. Other parts of the, the world have less, less industrialized tech, but things like guns in various degrees are pretty common across all the, um, all the nations, as well as like railroads and trains and stuff have become popularized. I mean, way less fossil fuels than anyone thought back in the 1930s, how weird tech would be now. Yep. Yeah, kind of pulpy, kind of pulpy. Um, so the Eisenstadt's role within the UFAS is they're a full member state of the UFAS. The real next site was the friends we made along the way. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, the Eisenstadt is a full member nation of the Federation. And while they, um, while they're socialist and stuff, they, uh, they're basically still a part of the overall, like, economic corporate system. It's just they ensure their people have much better rights, uh, you know, quality of living and, like, income distribution than other nations are probably willing to do. So there's less mega rich, but more people are treated pretty darn well. <laughs> And they're also like indirectly uh, kind of the the go tos for the international like union organizations and the other member states. But unions aren't as powerful in the other states as they are inside of the Eisenstadt. I was joking that I'm basically becoming a furry artist because so far all of the Federation characters I've made is Isabella de Valencia, the Hellhound girl from Casil, and then I've got Clara, the Hyena girl. Uh, the spotted hyena girl barbarian from Eisenstadt. Yeah, it's a collective bargaining association the size of a state, basically. <laughs> so you get the you get the best of all possible worlds with it. <laughs> um but yeah, so like to put it all of this in short, I got a lot of stuff about magic. I got a lot of stuff about the Fae. Um, there are no uh, normal D and D gods. Um, there is, there are no, um, there are no demons or devils. They're called Hellions, and they work kind of like, uh, 
kind of like spirits of excess. They are all about ambition and making deals to see who to see mortals advance themselves and their own personal ambitions and directives. They're all just like cute girls with animal features. It's true. It's known. The growl mint, if you would. <laughs> Suspiciously wealthy furries running the government. Um, and um, the nature of what Hellions are will also be explained in the campaign. But also, um, oh, I forgot one thing uh, that I talked about. Bards. We're going to briefly talk about bards. There, um, there are, there are machine guns and stuff, but they're, they're, they're not for, for, like, actual, like, campaign re purposes. Like, the normal firearms are basically broken down into, uh, generic pistol, like, revolver, generic bolt-action rifle, generic shotgun. Anything more than that is basically, like, they exist, but they're not gonna be, like, functional in the campaign as, like, stuff you're gonna buy and use. Oh yeah, there's lots of Knight Paladin Orders. There's Knight Paladin Orders that are a part of the different kingdoms and nations, as well as there's an extra national organization known as the Justicari, which is started off as basically uh, unionized adventurers who became a uh, uh, an extra state uh, international organization of peacekeepers. Um, but yeah, there's lots of Paladins. Like, for instance, uh, like... All of the different, uh, you know, federation states will have their own uh, forms of knightly orders and, uh, like, paladin orders. A lot of, lot of Oath of the Crown, real common in places like the federation, but, like, um, what's his name? Um, Lunas is a uh, Oath of, how was it called? Fucking, like, Oath of Grandeur or whatever. Oath of Glory paladin. Um, so those all exist. And then, um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, bards. Oath of Glory, yeah, yeah. So, bards... Bards actually get their magic in an interesting way. So, like, being a bard does not equal, like, you just have magic. Bards actually... There is... Something that a, a person can learn to do through um, through training and if their spirit resonates in the appropriate way. Where basically they can attract a spirit of creation. A spirit of creation is a magical, it's a magical force that um, basically attaches itself to a bard and creates substance out of their ideas. So this turns um, ideas into substance. That was the end of our seahorse. No. Turn on another seahorse in the background for a moment. There we go. This is just on in the background. Um, so, yeah, a bard has basically a soul resonance that attracts a spirit of creation that will then attach itself to them and make it so their ideas can then have substance and bearing. And this spirit of creation is called a muse. Oh, no. Every day... They're buffering. Oh well, Seahorse is buffering right now. Forgive them. Um, so every bard has a muse, which is literally a spirit of creation that attaches itself to them, and then it is shaped and molded and molded by the bard that it has attuned itself to. So there is, you know, some bards, their muse is a hot girl. Some bards, their muse is, you know, like a swanky bass player and stuff. Some bards, their muse is a cat. Who knows? It could be a piano cat. <laughs> Drawing big titty goth girl's muse, so it shall be I. 
We play Stairway to Heaven on the guitar. Also, the player's turn takes about 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's just like, it's a, it's like a unique thing for how bards work. It's not like a true arcane intelligence, but it is a spirit that starts forming basically some um, identity based on the bard that it has uh, attuned itself to. So, yeah, I thought, I, I'm glad you liked that. Yeah, I thought it was a cool idea. There is a theory, now this is going to go back to, back to Hellions. There is a theory that all spirits of creation and muses are actually, they're actually Hellions. Uh, because Hellions um, are obsessed with basically pacting themselves to mortals and then pushing mortals to do more to achieve more, to get more ambition, to experience more, to feel more. And so while that can be a good thing, it also could be a bad thing when taken down dark paths. So there is a theory in academic circles that is not super accepted because it's not substantiated, but there's a strong theory that muses are actually basically hellions. So, but yeah, but that's how I make bards. You're a bard if you have a special creative vibe to you that then you can um, train yourself and get focused in to attract a spirit of creation to attune itself to you. And then it provides your, the ability for making your ideas into uh, material things and will subsequently shape itself uh, and identity around the person it has attuned itself to. So that's a fun little thing about bards for you. <laughs> Do -do -do. So one of the exceptions is um, people who don't go to the afterlife are people who make pacts with otherworldly beings. Um, if you make a pact with an otherworldly being, you don't want to get to go to the other afterlife. You now are the property of your patron. <laughs> Metallica gets a Hellion attached that gives some amazing early albums before turning into stoogy corporate trash. Yep, basically, Brave Buster, basically. Hey, Thomas. Um, my mouth is drying out a lot, and I've been talking for almost two and a half hours. So I think we're going to conclude this info dumping session um, for the day. But I, I hope you guys had fun. I hope you, I hope you found it educational. I hope you, you learned something. You now have a higher interest in my setting um, for when I, I run it next. Um, it's likely going to be in several months um, for when I decide to run it because, you know, as I've talked about, um, once Ashes of the Last War is officially over, um, once Ashes of the Last War is officially over, I'm going to take a hiatus and just focus on me and decompressing. Since I've been streaming for three years at this point, I need a I need a break. So I'm gonna take time off of streaming. I'm still gonna be alive, don't worry. I'll still be in discords, I'll still harass people. Um, but, uh, oh shit, I just realized I can't do gremlin noises. Because of my gum graft, I can't actually make the sound of gremlin noises, Zara. Once I get the all clear, I owe you a gremlin noise, okay? Um, so, but once I come back, I'm going to be running this campaign, Nexus Forlorn Legacy, with my wonderful players, Maris, Sif, Lily, and B. I hope you come on by. I hope you watch it. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you're excited. If you're in my Discord, this is, this is your opportunity to, to, to bug me about my campaign and ask me questions about the world. I will answer them because I'm obsessed. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please give me a follow here on Twitch. Give me a sub over on YouTube. Give me a follow on Twitter. Thank you join my Discord, the Eternal Citadel. Be a part of my incredible community. I want you all to know you're all beautiful, amazing, and valid people. And I hope you enjoyed spending your night with me nearly as much as I enjoyed spending it with you. And never forget the most important part, which is the world is better having you in it. That'll be it for tonight, everybody. I don't know what I'm going to stream Wednesday or if I'm going to stream Wednesday. If I do, it's probably going to be art. We're probably going to draw more busty obsidia. Um, yeah, so you could also ask my players questions as well. They, they have become well-versed, even though they learn things as I do these streams. Um, so we'll find out Wednesday. Otherwise, I hope you guys have an amazing week. And this weekend, I'm going to be at KatsuCon on Saturday with Yuko. So if you're going and you want to say hi to me, 
let me know and I will say hi and I could give you a big uh, death knight hug. <laughs> um, we are going, if you're a follower, please copy down the call to hugs. If you're a sub, please copy down the knight's message. We're going to be raiding Dirge VT. He is doing a birthday slash redebut stream with his uh, werebat model. He is a good friend of my friend Jafar, um, as well as a fellow uh, uh, Death Knight VTuber <laughs> normally. So we're going to go send him some love. So please copy down the Knight's message if you are a sub and the call to hugs if you are a follower. Have a great night, everybody, and the sweetest of dreams. Bye!